So I've been asked to, to talk to this crowd today. Uh, trouble is I'm a programmer, right? So I can't talk. I just program. Uh, my name is Jörn Andrikvist. I co-founded this company 1990. I actually started hacking on the original Configura code 1989. First prototype was in AutoCAD. I brought a few relics fit for the museum. This is my first programming book, 6502 Game Programming. <laughs> I mean, you really should take a look in this. And this is for the really advanced stuff. Basic. My, this, that was from the, was, was maybe the, yeah, it was Apple II, yeah. I was, I was doing that on the ABC80 before that, the Swedish computer. Uh, it's really advanced. So 10 print Olle Andersson, 20 print telephone number list. <laughs> I highly recommend it. This is um, code. Dated 1992. It's a backup copy of Configura. <laughs> there, there might have been another bin in there. Uh, if you're curious, you should come and take a look at it. Because I'm surprised when I see this code. Because I know I have developed a little since we started. It's 30 years now. My skills have developed a little bit. But this actually looks very clean. So there was a fundamental philosophy that was there already from the start, and we've been keeping with that all this time. So what, where do I come from? D84, so the computer technology at the University here in Linköping, 1984. I, was a P I stayed as on as a PhD student, at, and at the end of that I, I began thinking about this, what, what became this company. Uh, during the time, I sp also s spent six months at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center in Silicon Valley. It's just by Stanford. Um, so, nice place. All right. So, what is PGC? I don't know how many th times I, I had this. PGC is really a very stupid nothing. It, it means you sit down in front of the computer and you try out a piece of software without any prior knowledge. And whatever annoys you, you should fix. <laughs> you get it? You know, when I sit down and I have to press the right button, I get annoyed. Why can't I do this in a more convenient way? Why can't the computer understand the gestures I'm doing? So if you stand behind a user, when he uses your piece of code, Take a look at what he tries and the way he approaches the software and the way he tries to get an understanding of it. That is what creates PGC. So it's really from the start a number of very small and simple ideas, but we combine them all together. We get this very powerful user interface. And I, I really hope that you dig into this idea because that is what makes CT and Configura different from other software out there. So, we've done a little programming language stuff here. Why did we do that? You and I sat in, we had C, when we started on series, um, the, these uh, spark stations, Sun spark stations. It was like 16 megahertz, 32-bit uh, computer with real Unix. So it was a real computer. The PC at the time was a toy running only DOS. You know, no memory protection, nothing that you're used to, no, no real graphics. No windows, for that matter. <laughs> we had these uh, spark stations over there. Uh, around 91, 92, we had, I think, the turnaround time for adding a print in your code was between 30 and 60 seconds. And we were highly annoyed because both of us are highly impatient people. We don't like to wait. So what is a programmer <laughs> in most situations in the world today? I, I got, I got a, a kid coming in and worked here for six months, and he was at Saab before, and he said that he was working on, they had a, a programming language there for programming missiles, I think. And the turnaround time was 50 to 55 minutes, and there was a ton of manual build steps, steps as well. Wonderful, huh? So what is a programmer in that context? It's a highly skilled, highly paid professional that waits for computers. Very, very efficient. So we didn't want to do that. We, we were long in 91, 92. Our conversation was we want an incremental programming language like Lisp or Basic or whatever, but we need the speed of C. We can't have a slow interpreter. It won't work. So we started uh, doing all sorts of various experiments. 
or trying to make very efficient interpreters, for example, that was the, the Z-switch-based interpreter, and then I did a, a threaded, uh, there's an extension in new C which um, enables you to, to switch jump on an address. So, so your code becomes just jump, 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 and jump back. So it's, it's a highly efficient interpreter, still way too slow. So the, the, the last one before CM and CVM was um, F1, where I tried to use at the, the, the JVM backend at the time, so Java Virtual Machine. It wouldn't do incremental, so if I changed one class and it, the other, another class used it, I had to reload both of them into it, and I thought this will not work for a bigger system. So I actually had a version of a compiler on top of JVM doing my own programming language compilation down to JVM code. But no, I threw it away. And then we started on what we're doing today that you're all familiar with. So let's, let's go on. Again, this philosophical question, why do we program computers? What's the point? No one? <laughs> you're all programmers, aren't you? To help people, ah, that's a good one. Hmm? Make businesses more efficient. Yeah, efficiency. So automation, if you boil it down, right? So a, in, in a sense, is a computer is a robot without legs. So what's the definition of a robot in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? <laughs> there are a couple of them. There's a plastic pal that's fun to be with, right? That's Marvin. But if you take the non-marketing version, it's a machine that's meant to do the work of man. It's, if it's meant to do the work of man, it's automating things that we otherwise manually have to do. So now we have a robot without legs and it should automate our work. We should not adapt to the computer, right? This is fundamentally the most important thing I can teach you. So that means when you make a program or when you're working with a computer, you should adapt the computer to fit you and to fit the users, not the other way around. So, what do we really do? Lump of code. I had about half an hour of, of preparation, but I did this lecture for, for the university, so. Um, yeah, so, so when we're hacking something together, uh, I mean, it's, it's not much of an engineering, is it? It's more like a dark art of magic, and there are different magic users, right? They have different spells. They, they like different patterns. One like reactive programming, and other one like imperative standard program or object-oriented or whatever. So somehow you get it to work. Do you understand the code? If it's more than 10 lines. Do you even understand 10 lines? I don't. So, so it's really a lot of some subconscious and strange stuff going on. So what, what <laughs> Yeah, let's just go on. Uh, hmm. when, we're, when we create any type of program with the regular tools that we're used to, like functions or function names, method names, you have a couple over here. There is a device begin paint up there. And then there are some draw lines and there's an end paint on there. And I, I added a little dragon there on the end paint because don't forget it, or there will be dragons, right? The system will crash, because you're leaking. So, but what, when you created the, the device dot begin end, et cetera, you are creating what? Creating a couple of functions? Yes, but you're also implying a syntax, because there's no way to express the syntax with the regular programming language. It's implied with these words. And then you have to tell every programmer that will ever use this device thing that if you type the begin thing you always have to have the end there right otherwise it will go to crap so why don't we make a proper programming language instead so we could abstract this up so th this is all leading up to to that it's also interesting to just consider software development in general because it is fundamentally an unbounded additive pro uh, uh, process don't you agree? Why is it unbounded? Why aren't we just doing it? Oh, my, my grandmother actually asked me, uh, I think like eight years into Configura, uh, aren't you finished with that program? <laughs> <laughs> it's very cute, right? 
<laughs> we're not yet finished. It is unbounded. One of the most important properties of our minds is that we can forever zoom into smaller details. And there's no end to that. And there's also the other dimension of just adding more modules, more functions. But for every function, we can also refine and refine and refine it. And every time we refine it, it improves and we will find a smaller fault and that fault will stand out as the most important and that has to be fixed right now. Go into hi-fi if you don't know this and you will switch cables. So. So we fundamentally create programs through language. I don't think we really create it through language. It's the thinking is more mysterious than that, but we formulate it through language, right? That's programming language. So precise, consistent, and orthogonal is the key words here. If you don't have precise names <coughs> or meanings of everything, it will not be good. If it's, not, if it's orthogonal, that means they're not overlapping, so you can combine them in various ways and get new results and it will work in expected ways, right? And consistent, yeah, it hangs together the way it should. So, uh, I'm building up to language as an abstraction in a programming language is the most powerful powerful thing that we can provide a programmer with. Uh, basically, this is part of geometry function and it's not all that great. You see, if, if we look at how can we even guarantee that we tested all the branches, etc. But this is typical code. There's a lot of, of it out there. So I would not recommend us to create code like this. I would refactor it, take out pieces of it, name it. Because now it's just one big blob of things. And this, maybe this is useful for something else, but uh, it's embedded inside this function, so it can't be reused, right? It is embedded, it can only be used in that context. So a programming value change is, you know, you're making very low value down here and you're making high value up there. But that also means the most powerful mechanism, which is designing language, is also the most difficult one. So everyone should not do it. Do you know what happened to Lisp? I mean, Lisp in around since like the 50s. It's still pretty much the same because it's an ingenious language. It has the full ability to change its language. You can hook into everything, change the reader of the... It's ingenious, it's super. It should be, it, it must be the, the language of gods, right? Don't oh, I, I have the slide later. <laughs> but it seems like it ended up in the uh, death that was caused by pro every programmer changed the language. So you could more or less not read a single programming list without, you have to go through all of the code to find all the macros that changes all the meaning. So it's, because it's, it's not really even the same semantics in the fundamental part of the system. So you don't even know it's a function call, it's a function call. Do you see what I mean? It, it gets very difficult to communicate or even combine. How can you use an external library if it's not built on the same style, conventions, and semantics, etc.? So, so it, 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 I mean, it still lives, but it lives a very, very small lisp. So I don't think there is a fundamental problem with us providing a feature that allows us to create language. It is, it would be, a blessing <laughs> compared to what templates in C++ That's another programming style, right? But we have to use it with smart. So we have to be very careful. The more, the more powerful the thing that we're using in the programming language, the more important it is that we use it the right way. So even if we go prop ob and go dynamic, or we use the new X API, if we use it the wrong way, it's just going to go crap. You really use it only when it's required. If I introduce interfaces, it's basically multiple inheritance. There's just new cute names for it. It requires the same thing inside a compiler as any multiple inheritance system. 
if I do that, and I, there are real cases where you really need it, but it tends to get overused in all sorts of situations and it gets a terrible spaghetti. So that, that's sort of why we have not yet provided it. It might come in the future version. So here is the list thing. Well, I'll skip that today. Mm -hmm. So why are things like they are in, in CM? Why don't we type while like they do in C++? Um, oh, they type four in C++. That, that slide is wrong. I remember there was something wrong with it. The top one says four in C++, right? And in CM it says while. I call it the conceptual slide because for comes fundamentally from logic, you know, for each x belonging or set theory, for each x belonging to, and then you make a constraint condition and you have enumerated some domain. So that's for for me, the history of for. So for should be something that for x that belongs to, that's why I use the in word in the for syntax. Uh, so conceptual slide is not all that great. And why, why, when you create a new language, would you carry the syntax of C from 1970s, where you have to remember to, take, to type the break and the default is just a plain fall through? So, you know, all those two are reversed. So, semicolon ends, or the statement ends the, the, the case in CM, and the default is you have to explicitly say, I'm going to fall through, otherwise, you're going to get a bug. So, there's a, there's a bunch of this, you know, going on. What's the most important statement that you will ever use? Uh, the most number of times, it's 100 times more than anything else, it's a print. Because you don't know what you're doing, so you have to find out what you're doing. So, so we shortened that out to PLN. I've been thinking about other changes to the PLN syntax, but I haven't really c come up with any. Doesn't anyone else have any good ideas of what we could have? Like the hash syntax, A equals, and the value of A? Isn't that a fantastic little addition? I use it all the time. I really like the more convenient way to get colors than calling a function, but it's pretty convenient because you know I use this EB blue, for example. So Emacs bold blue all the time to distinguish one print from one section of the code from another, for example. I think we step into this. The seven golden rules of programming. I wrote this a long time ago. So we're not going to read the small print. We're just going to read the title. And this is more of a discussion thing. So I, I changed. This is the only one I changed in all these years. Stay incremental at all times. So it comes back to, to the beginning of this talk, right? Stay incremental means that we all never wait on the computer, or as far as it is ever possible. So why do, why do we have to iterate? We already have this incremental programming language. Well, a lot of programmers tend to build this uh, create step, and then you publish, and you load, and then you run. And when the database grows big, this goes up to minutes. So you created a non-incremental system on top of an incremental system, and you're dead again. You're dead in the water and just sitting there and waiting for these publishing steps. So I mean, if, if you sit there and click in a UI like catalog creator, or if you're programming code, there's no fundamental difference. You have to make a change. You have to do the full cycle until you can test the thing. Uh, until there, you don't know. So it's fundamentally programming. It's just another programming language with a lot, of, lot less expressive power and flexibility. So stay incremental, and don't forget that. Um, that also means for every, everything you do, you're daily activity when you're sitting there and I'm just going to fix this bug but I have to step there click there do this automate the test cycle uh, give it a statement at the end of your file where you're most uh, do most of your editing so you can control alt p and do the complete thing this is staying incremental as well so it's the mindset of doing a fully automatic turnaround ah just going to do a few repeats it usually ends up with a hundred right Am I wrong? It takes a hundred times before you really understand, before you really grok what's going on. So this is really important as well. Straightest possible path to the goal. It can be misread as 
write ugly dirty code yeah if you can do that and get to the goal fine but i can't so i don't i refactor very quickly i very quickly refine and refactor the code because i think it gets me to the goal quicker i don't like debugging i like to refine the code instead so the best debugging is not debugging at all period but anyway you can get to the goal because before you're at the goal for example the snapper that's going to snap or whatever you make this this snapper do something else some gesture interpretation before you're there you don't know if it's a good idea or not you have to test it out by feel pgc is feel in the end how does it feel when i use this no it's all crap with all these situations of bef before snapping became what it is that you know today in the beginning we, we were messing around with with all these styles so you came in and it snapped and you moved just one pixel with the mouse and it snapped out. it popped out to the, to the cursor again so it wasn't stable it was popping in and out like this that's a very typical thing of, oh it felt like a good idea to base it on this situation but when you saw it in reality it was crap so just redo it again it's really interesting when you have when you're going through from one of these styles that doesn't work and you say oh if i go there it's always greener on the other side right then it's going to be great and you go there it's good no that's crap hmm maybe if i go there it's going to get good and you're toggling so you're toggling between two bad ideas <laughs> and they don't work either one of them it happened a couple of times so shortcuts to the goal that means cut away all everything that's not required right now just to get up and get a feel and then go back and refine it until it is the highest possible quality solve the real problem yeah this is hard that the, this the previous one is part of this you can't know if you're solving the real problem unless you you get something out there sometimes you have to get it all the way to the users so they can try it out so if you're going to design this new supermodel you, that you know is so fantastic and you're sitting there for three years in your chamber and it comes out and no i don't want that i want that so it's all shooting on the side so so this is total misuse of time write beautiful code so code has to you know <laughs> i i often get in conflict with academics because they tend to advocate commenting and i don't really like commenting do you know why? It gets old. It gets old fast. I don't know if it has three weeks. It's, it's, it's more like milk. You know, it gets sour very quickly, and then it's worse. So, so you get into this piece of code. That's, that's, uh, maybe I wrote it or someone else, and I read this comment, and I look at the code. Look at the comment. Look at the code. The comment has nothing whatsoever to do with the current situation. And it might explain some complex relationship between different things in this, this situation. So what do we need the code for? Or the, the comment? The comment is more or less an obfuscation or even misinformation, you know, intentionally created to derail my mind <laughs> from what I need to know about this. So there's only one way that will work and that making the program as easy to read as possible that will be maintained because that is what is running that will be kept alive and that is what makes you understand the code and then of course you can use strange patterns or not etc so there's a lot of into this design that goes into making the code understandable and readable but beautiful comes from the idea that you should be able to ac actually even to put the code up on a wall you know and, and then look at it from a distance does it look good enough develop your basic programming skill to the extreme i was watching this video of this th these two violinists playing the other day and uh, one of them uh, b both were amazing and and then they had these pieces where one played and the other looked and, th and then they reversed and changed and this uh, this guy comes up and he starts playing with all 10 fingers at the same time and he makes music it just looks like magic it it's a level of attachment or or interface to his violin that's unbelievable but both had it you know they're great musicians so if we're programming and it's a black art can we get away with bad typing skills no we have to be really good at typing and emacs that's our primary tools uh, 
I don't know anything else than Emacs that allows you to work that fast that is required. So you, you shouldn't, there shouldn't be a, any trouble in refactoring a thousand lines of code. It sh should be done in 10 minutes, five minutes, three minutes. Just model it, change it around, turn it around, query replace, move this to that, make it look better. No, that, that didn't work well. Keep working on it. So it's like a piece of clay that you're modeling out until it's good. And if you're not good enough with your fingers, it's not gonna happen. Then it's difficult, slow, troublesome. So this is really an, an important point. Surprise your boss. That means don't just take, uh, you know, you, you get, uh, someone decides we should fix this problem and try to make it better at the same time, not just make the minimal fix or we'll make a patchwork out of the software. We easily, very easily make a patchwork by just looking in Jira, fixing the specific ticket. It's a high risk also that we make uh, bugs, side bugs that comes from this. So it's not a good, a good idea at all. Take care of your health. You know how many, how many seconds a brain cell will function without oxygen and sugar? It's about seven, eight seconds. If you don't believe me, come up and I'll strangle you. <laughs> we'll see how long you can take it. <laughs> Isn't that great? I mean, a muscle cell has like 20 minutes, 30 minutes before you, you can just staunch it up here and it will still live, you know. And, and the nerve, the nerve extensions, they will live, but not, not the nerve cells themselves. They're really highly developed and highly sensitive and highly active. We also need to rest. So how do you rest from something that's so intensive that your brain thinks it's a survival when you focus so much on something? Haven't you noticed? You focus so much that you go into, like, we have to solve this or we die. Th that's that's m basically what we do every day. So if you take this home, your brain is gonna turn on with this and you're gonna you know, risk going into the wall, burn out. That's the highest risk of this occupation, I think. So what you require is detachment. You have to detach yourself from that thinking. But you know what happens when you do that? If you're really good, at, I mean, really detaching means you have to do something completely different, like go and do sports for a full hour. When you get out of there, you should be empty in your mind. There should not be a single thought about work. But then the real work happens in your mind, because then the sort of the holistic thing starts happening. So the next day, when you come back to work, something has happened already and you can make much better solution out of the code than you could by just trying harder, 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 and, you, and trying to apply logic and, and standard thinking. So, so that is absolutely, absolutely required to do anything at any high level. And it's also very, very good for our health. So I highly recommend it. So, any Questions? I would like this to be a little bit more interactive. I wasn't really planning to do all that <coughs> PowerPointing. Any questions? Anything you would like to talk about? I mean, let's not talk about how you make a snapper. That's for the other sessions. So more philosophically, why is seem the way it is? Why do I program the way I do? How do I approach something specific? Or, or you want to see me, see me do push-ups? I can do that too. Yeah. So they it's don't make any sense. They make they confuse you more. It makes it more difficult to read. What's this? Uh, I will. Alex actually will show you that I'm lying. <laughs> I change. No, I changed my style a little. So I, I'm trying. When I said something out, this is Xclip. Xclip has grown into. It's it's not a small project anymore. It used to be just this little renderer that can render in a polygon something else that this is in another space. So it's a basically a viewport. But I'm starting to try to summarize some type of conceptual overview in a readme that I put in the same directory. So, but it's really hard to keep up to date. Yeah. And, and, and as soon as the requirement changes anything, you have, to, you have to be obliged to go back and fix this. Or it's it will- to remember as a yeah. programmer,
programmer. Yes, exactly. And then, and then you sit here and, and sit there and evaluate every line that you wrote. Xlib is a pr printed through GDI view, etc. Is it still, still true? Yeah, it, that one probably is, but you know, every statement in this file is, has to be really carefully monitored or it's crap. And you, you do know that we, we have interface comments, so we try to, to comment our interfaces, but we don't spend like... <laughs> uh, yeah. Now the philosophy is there is, is in, in cr fix the language instead of fixing it through comments. There, 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 is, a, there is an old joke, I think it was from a, a very early Byte. Byte magazine was these big pieces of computer magazines that came out once a month in the 80s. Uh, so there was this uh, article about the future AI compiler. You know what it would do? Of course it knows that you only create bugs, so it would read your comments and compile that instead. <laughs> I wonder what kind of code would come out. <laughs> there, there, was, there was an early compiler, of one, one of these, oh, I forgot what the name was, but you could actually write a piece of Shakespeare to it and it will, would create a program. The reason for it, so, so it, would, it would try syntax and try to fix the syntax in every possible way until it got the working program. Even if you just input nonsense into it, it would create the program. Because uh, uh, <coughs> the situation was that, that it took a full, 24 hours turnaround to get the program to run because you had to punch cards, insert them into a batch queue, and then get the result the next day. So, so even if the result wasn't perfect, sometimes you could match the what, what how the compiler changed the program to a result that still would be useful. <laughs> it's a little different today, right? <laughs> yeah, good, good question, by the way. Yeah. And it will change color and say this comment is mm. like six months old. It's, it's, yeah, it's highly interesting, but I'm not sure if it's a compiler or, or Emacs or Git or what, what it is. Yeah, I but I, I, I've been thinking about exactly that, so it, <laughs> it will fade out. <laughs> yeah. find, find a way to do that. <laughs> or, or maybe go to, towards red. <laughs> it's less and less informative. What, what was the, the oldest cut is out that we had? 2000. Well, from the 90s. 90s, yes. Good, eh? <laughs> That's also another reason to comment, of course. Yeah, question. How do you approach old uh, non git repositories? Do you like rewrite it or do you just. Yeah, I, I can't even read it without changing it. So, my, my own style of under trying to understand some piece of code which I get into is start, start to change it. I might very well throw the changes away. It depends on why I'm doing the changes, but but I have no. I, I can't just sit and read from start to end. It's not my mind doesn't work that way. Well, do you think us as an organization should do that? I mean, it's it's. I think it's bug prone to refactor all the time. How do you think we should approach it? Because it is. I, I agree. I. You shouldn't refactor all the time. You shouldn't refactor when you're fixing a critical bug in re release <laughs> in the release cycle. But at all other times, I think you should refactor all the time. I mean, when you're in your regular project. So, and I don't think it's bug prone. I think it's it's bug eradicating. You combine refactoring with test suites, then uh, you very quickly. Uh, you often do. You can do a refactor which you feel is 100% safe, and you have a test suite, and it catches an error, and then you have to rethink. Uh, and that's that's really an amazing teaching tool to to make your yourself understand the little edge cases that might be in there, but then you have to put in the work and, and do the the test suite, otherwise it won't work. So and, and of course it's much harder for for UI based things to do test suites, but many times you can test fundamental functionality like bring a snapper in. Uh, click on this quick prop, I mean, click uh, set this property, and then, then you check that something else has happened, and you just verify that very simple fact, and you remove it, and you, re you make sure that both got removed with the test suite. Then you have a, a little test cycle, and you can test very fundamental things, but it, you're going to have a repeated test that you can run forever after that. And very quickly, you start getting new ideas of these little tests that you can keep adding to it. And, you, and, and so, you, so you get a baseline test that's, that just can be run all the time. It's highly, highly efficient. 
Mm -hmm. More? I could describe a pain point that I have with that. Um, so much of uh, what we're doing is, you know, user experience, trying to streamline yeah. user behavior, uh, and it's very difficult to write test scripts for that. Yeah. Right. We can we can unit test methods in a class or whatnot, but actually testing whether or not dragging the cursor this way behaves well no. is kind of difficult. And there, and there are so many aspects to it. Even responsiveness, time is is important. Uh, and time is is difficult to. I mean, you might change something, and it looks, it doesn't look uh, dangerous, but it will change the timing <coughs> of things and make it sluggish or slow, and then then the user experience suffers. But it's usually simpler than that. So, I, I think we have so much backlog of user experience. So, do you use the software? Do you draw with it? If you don't, you have to start. Otherwise, how can you have an, any idea what you're doing? It's like ha building a car or designing engines for cars and never driving in a, a car. It's ridiculous if you think about it. You have to set, sit down and try to design something. That's the only way to get a feel for what the software actually do. You have to use it. Imagine you're a dealer and you, you want to make a, an office layout. And then sit down and do an office layout. Spend some time with this. Well, take the draw tools and sit there and draw for a while and see what annoys you. That really is the only way. There's no manual. We can't sit down and write a PGC manual. It has to work this and that and that and this. And there should be invention. I mean, this, this fundamental idea of, of automating and making it easy and gesture-based should, should create invention in the long run. But I'm not, seeing, I'm not really seeing this, and I'm frustrated. I'm wondering why it doesn't happen. We're a big organization. We're a lot of developers. There are external developers as well. Doesn't anyone want to do that? Oh, customer doesn't want to pay for it. Uh -huh. Do they even know they can get it? Uh, are we so bad programmers that we can barely make a function happen? So we just get our nose over the water line and can breathe a little and then we're sinking again? Is that programming? So. This comes back to the golden principle. I mean, we have to develop our skills to the point where we can model with the code. So if we have eight weeks of project times to make a feature, then in two weeks we have to have something we can test out. Otherwise, there will never be PGC, right? If we barely make it to eight weeks to get anything to work and it's a little buggy at that time, it's not going to be PGC for sure. So our own efficiency has to be higher and we have to use each other's knowledge. This, the, the new thing I'm trying to create with this architect-based uh, organization and RRT is to create development time and communication so we can spread this knowledge and, and reuse all the experience that, that exists at Configura. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Shall we hack something? I don't know. I didn't really expect this crowd. Uh -huh. I wrote this just a couple of days back and it's just a skeleton because I, I gave it away. Um, let's just take a quick look at it. Um, uh, there's been some discussions about reactiveness and, uh, and not. And if you think about it, object-oriented programming is usually reactive. So, because you're sitting there in your method, maybe it's an example is in X, X clip, uh, there is a source snapper and there is a wormhole snapper. The wormhole is the viewport itself where it shows what is cut out from the main space. So then you are in unsuspended. So someone probably pressed undo, the control Z. So we're in unsuspended. And we react to unsuspended. So we have to start, start up our, uh, the, the clipping renderer, for example. We have to initialize things, go and get the scale from the source. Crash. Source doesn't exist 50% of the time. There's probably a hash table in the background. So if we're just reactive and looking locally at it, it looks right to just do the access through source. It works all the other times in all other situations. It's a very safe access to do. But in this situation, the source has not yet been unsuspended. So just doing it reactive can be kind of bad. And what, what else? There is a high risk that we call something, that calls something, that calls us back, and we're reactively recursively, more or less, uh, going recursive on this. So, so uh, 
So when you do that immediately, you don't really have any feel for the number of times it's going to be done in the span of the event loop either. Right? So someone else might also call this situation and, and do the same things over and over again. And even if you don't call unsuspended, you might call something that gets other things done that was done by unsuspended. So we lose control over time, right? So this thing that lo looks very simple and easy from the start, it suddenly becomes a time monster because it cascades and cascades again. So th th the basic remedy for that is just using validations. Simple invalidation flag. So instead of doing it now, do it later. And th this is a much simpler example. Uh, we want to track the visible viewers of a space. So I wrote this little micro thing. Th this is a very quick sketch. sketch. There's an invalid flag. There are the, visib the current visible um, sequence. Uh, it's, it's taken from a set, so the sequence is faster. Um, so if we're asking for visible wormhole snappers, then it looks at invalid, and if it's invalid, it updates, and then it returns visible. So then th this way is lazily delaying the actual computation that's required to know this fact until the time when you ask for it. So if you never ask for it, you never need to spend the time. If you're reactive and just doing it now, it's going to happen immediately, right? So yeah, you can't say for sure that this would be a good time, but then we know that it's probably not going to be more than a couple of hundred in the worst, worst possible cases. And the test for visible is actually super fast. It's a sequence or a set any question. So it's checking count equals zero. So we don't worry about time. It's probably a microsecond to recompute, to do the update. So, so, so you see, there's a number of things going on here. I'm trying to, to minimize the delays for the critical path. I'm also trying to consider what happens if there are 10,000 viewers going into the system instead of the regular test case, which is one or two. One or two is not hard to get quick, right? <laughs> well, if it really is 10,000, yeah, that's why I, I'm going through visible as well. I don't want to compute this thing that I'm going to use this for on all 10,000 that are not visible right now. If, if you can't see them, why should you compute something for them? So that's why I want to determine this specific fact as well. So, so just, just an example for re from recent reality. Do you use control C or? Or just read me. Um, Say I'm, I'm working here in uh, Snapper 2D. I want to do rebuild, but maybe I also want to render. Maybe I have some test code in here in Stencil Renderer, Stencil Buff Renderer. So I do Control C R and Control Y. And now I can Control Alt P and it will run that file as well. We have a bunch of these things that are there so we can cut down the cycle, right? So it, we can stay incremental at all times. So write up your test code. Do you ever use seam runtime reflections? Do you know how easy it is? 4G in globals or for C in classes? Find 4F in C dot fields. If you get a field that matches, you take the field dot name, match the name towards something you're looking for, and you take F dot source dot error prefix and you can next error to that if you feel on it so you can you can search through the whole database of your program and make specific matches and just next error to to whatever matches you need for example so that's one way of making it tool another way is of course to make a ui like like the inspector but why settle with the inspector why don't make your own it's not hard <laughs> it's really fast to do your own tools if you need them so don't get into this mindset where you're, because we're used to a monopoly on the build tools and the programming language tools, but now there's not a real monopoly. Yeah, there's a little monopoly for changing the compiler for real, but there is so much that you can do outside of the compiler. And that means we can build our own, own programming or debugging tools as well that are specific to the task we're trying to do. And there are 100 different debug 
methodologies that I, I know and, uh, and I can apply. Uh, they're all, uh, my style is very basic. It's mostly fencing. Fencing means cutting out the big parts of the system so I get a smaller area, a small area of suspicion. But there are very various ways of, of approaching the fencing depending on if you're looking for a resource leak or if you're looking for a crash or what, whatever you're looking for. I mean, a basic crash is so easy. It, it, it points there, it just makes error, right? But if, if the crash is not really related to this, the cause, you have to fence the problem in through a repeat. So don't hesitate to ask if this ever occurs. And you get into a hard debug scenario, then I it probably can help you work faster. Mm -hmm. All right. So, thank you. Thank you.